Hello everybody, welcome back again and we are going to continue with lecture 4. In this lecture we are going to continue discussing social perception and social cognition and in particular the psychology of impression formation, the use of heuristics, prototypes and stereotypes. Throughout the lecture I will try to emphasize the relevance of the material we discuss to real life issues and real life problems and throughout the lecture there will be a number of additional internet links that you can click on to view additional relevant material. Impression formation can be influenced by a number of other biasing factors or weighting factors if you like. Uh, one of the most important of these is halo effects. Halo effects occur when a person has one perhaps outstanding favorable or sometimes unfavorable characteristic such as warm or cold and perceivers therefore assume that all of their characteristics are also favorable. In other words we generalize from one known positive or negative feature and assume that other characteristics will be similar as well. The first demonstration of halo effects is a famous study by Dion Burscheid and Wolster in 1972 who showed that physical attractiveness looking good is an important source of halo effects in personality judgment. Dion Burscheid and Wolster took photos of a large number of female students at the university and then had the photos rated for physical attractiveness so they had highly attractive intermediate and unattractive photos. They then showed these photos to another group of participants and asked them to form personality judgments about the individuals. Now if we stop for a moment here think about how strange that request is. How can you form judgments about a person's personality based on a photo alone. One of the interesting messages of this study is that people have no difficulty doing that. They do it because based on the photo, the limited information they have about physical attractiveness, they are able to generate expectations of what other characteristics are likely to be. Dion Burscheid and Wolster found that uh, good-looking attractive females were judged universally as having more positive and more desirable characteristics than unattractive ones. In other words, physical attractiveness functioned as a halo source for judgments of other unrelated qualities. Sometimes the halo effects are even more surprising. Wilson in 1968 published a study where university students were asked to listen to a guest lecturer who was introduced either as high in social status, a professor from a highly prestigious university, or low in social status, a graduate student from a non-prestigious university. It was the same person in both conditions. But obviously some people expected the person to have high social status, academic status and others expected the opposite. Wilson asked the students who saw that person giving a lecture afterwards to form a number of judgments about him including a question about his physical height. How tall is that person? And what Wilson found was that higher academic status produced a significantly taller height estimate than low academic status. In other words, academic status influenced judgments of physical height. Uh, if you think about it, that happens often in everyday life. Famous people, well-known people are often mentally expected to be tall and sometimes when we meet them they are surprised that they are not as tall as we thought they were. We use their fame as a halo effect and estimate their height accordingly. Sometimes halo effects occur even for very subtle cues. McDavid and Harari asked participants to rate the same essay written by 11-year-olds 
and only manipulated one thing, the name of the writer. In some condition, the name was an unusual, strange name, like Hubert or Elmer, and in other condition, the same essay was attributed to a John or a David. And what McDavid and Harari found that the name alone had a significant biasing effect on the grade given to the essay. John and David got better marks for the same essay as Hubert and Elmer. Again, it's an illustration of how one piece of completely unrelated information exudes an influence on judgments. Uh, these sorts of halo effects sometimes can also be important. Birmingham in 2000 published a study where he gave 400 British psychiatrists a description of a 24-year-old man who assaulted a conductor. Uh, and uh, he was called either Matthew or Wayne. Matthew is a common name. Wayne is a somewhat unusual name. He found that the 400 British psychiatrists significantly more tended to see Matthew as schizophrenic and Wayne as a lazy drug user with a personality disorder. In other words, based on the name alone, they formed inferences about the causes of the aggressive episode. Now, halo effects occur in everyday life all the time and have very important implications. We tend to assume that a person who has achieved something in a field, for example, sport or fashion or pop music, therefore has qualifications that make them competent in other fields as well. Uh, celebrities are often asked for their opinions on matters that they don't know anything about. And whenever you see a sports star or a pop star being interviewed on TV, they usually make fools of themselves because their achievement in one domain does not generalize to another domain. Halo effects is what makes humans to assume that people who have positive qualities in one field will have similar qualities in other fields, even when there is no real evidence for this. It turns out that halo effects can be partly dependent on the kind of information processing style that people adopt, how you think. If you use system one thinking, halo effects are stronger. When you use system two thinking, they are weaker. We tested this prediction in an experiment published in 2011, when we asked participants at this university to read an essay, a philosophical essay, and we attached an image to the essay. In one condition, it was the image of a young, somewhat unusual looking female. And in the other condition, it was a middle-aged, apparently middle-class man who kind of looked more like a philosopher. In addition, we manipulated the mood state of the participants. In one condition, they were in a positive, happy mood. And in the other condition, they were in a negative, sad mood. Now, a halo effect should occur if people judge the essay and the competence of the person differently, depending on the photo. Typically, people expect middle-aged males to be more likely to be typical philosophers than the image of the female that you see. Uh, so the halo effect is the difference between the white and the blue graphs uh, in three conditions, by people making a judgment in a positive mood, in a control condition, and in the negative mood condition. And as you can see, the picture, the photo, made the biggest difference when people were in a positive mood, and the least difference when they were in a negative mood. Now, the reason for that is that we do know that positive and negative mood has a subtle effect on information processing. People in a positive mood tend to think more superficially, heuristically, make less effort to produce a judgment. People in a negative mood think more carefully, thoroughly, and systematically. So when negative mood produces a more careful thinking style, that tends to reduce the size of the halo effect. The halo effect is a function of the information processing strategy that a person 
at all. Uh, another important biasing factor in impression formation is called the primacy effect. That refers to the fact that whatever information you come across first has a bigger impact on the total impression that impressions information that you acquire later. The classic study on that was again done by Solomon Ash in 1946, where he gave people lists of traits to describe a person. In one condition, the description said intelligent, industrious, impulsive, critical, stubborn, envious. Three positive traits followed by three negative ones. In the other condition, the order was reversed. The person was described as critical, stubborn, envious, intelligent, industrious, impulsive. So the question is, does it matter if you reverse the order of the traits? Ash found that it had a huge impact. Whatever came first had a bigger influence. First impressions, primacy effects were dominant. In a similar study, Lukins used paragraphs to describe a target called Jim as either an extrovert or an introvert in two different orders. And once again, whatever came first had a significantly greater effect on the resulting impressions. Again, a primacy effect. One explanation for this is the so-called assimilation of meaning hypothesis that predicts that people quickly make up their minds, form an impression based on the first few items, and then later items tend to be reinterpreted to be consistent with this earlier impression. In other words, the meaning of the last three traits becomes somewhat different depending on what the first three traits are like. This is consistent with Solomon Ash's Gestalt theory, that impressions are made up to be coherent to make a good, meaningful whole. Jones and others in 1968 showed the same effect. When you give people a 30 item, uh, answers to a 30 item test where the first 15 are not very good, the second 15 are good and reverse the order, people form a far more positive impression of the test taker when the positive items come first and a negative impression when the negative item comes first. One way you can reverse these primacy effects is to make people think more carefully, to induce more careful thinking. In one experiment, we did that, again published in 2011, where we gave people descriptions of a target using the techniques used by Lukins uh, the descriptions were either an extroverted or an introverted person in two different orders, and we got judges in a positive or a negative mood to form judgments. And once again, on the figure on the right hand side, you can see the difference between the blue and the white columns is the size of the primacy effect. The information was the same. It's just that in one condition, the introvert came first, in the other condition, the extrovert came first. These are judgments of extroversion. And you can see that when extroversion comes first, people are much more likely to form an extrovert judgment than when the introvert, introversion comes first. And this effect is biggest in a happy mood and disappears in a negative mood. So once again, being in a negative mood, produces more thorough thinking, and that more careful thinking eliminates the primacy effect. Another bias in impression formation is the positivity negative bias, and that refers to the fact that essentially in social life, our baseline expectation is that people should behave positively in socially desirable ways. So when you don't know anything about a person, your judgments will still tend to be positive because you assume that positivity is expected. In the absence of information, we have a positivity bias. However, when any negative information becomes available because negativity is undesirable and unusual, 
negative information will then have a disproportionately strong effect. So in the absence of information, we have a positivity bias. Negativity, once information is available, tends to have a disproportionately great influence on impressions. Uh, now, so far, we looked at impression formation in terms of universal distortions and biases. But in addition to those universal distortions, each of us individually also has a particular private implicit theory of personality, a view of human nature. These private theories of people can be defined as a set of assumptions based on our own perceptions about which personality characteristics are associated with which others. Uh, when I say to you a word, a sentence like John is energetic, eager, and intelligent or stupid, you will have some tendency to assume that energetic and eager people are more likely to be intelligent rather than stupid. You base this judgment on an implicit assumption of human personality. In your personal experience, energetic and eager people were perhaps more likely to be intelligent. So you extrapolate from what you know to what you don't know. Implicit personality theories are based on personal experiences, which can be individual, unique to each one of us, but also partly culturally determined. We have common notions of what personality is like. It's interesting that implicit personality theories are revealed in the way we describe people. In an interesting study, Rosenberg and Jones in 1972 analyzed personality descriptions in a novel by Theodore Dreiser, an American writer who was long dead by then. And simply by analyzing how often particular traits co-occur are used together in describing a character by Dreiser, allowed Rosenberg and Jones to calculate statistically a model of Theodore Dreiser's theory of people, his implicit theory of personality. So for example, if he used energetic and eager in the company of intelligent relatively often, then that would suggest that in his mind, these qualities were more likely to be associated. And this is revealed in his characterization of the people in the novel. If you look at the sentences at the bottom of the slide, uh, you could complete them uh, in terms of what your personal uh, individual theory of people or personality theory is. So for example, Julie is bright, lovely, lively, and thin or fat. In your view, are thin people more likely to be bright and lively or fat people are more likely to be bright and lively. Joe is handsome, tall, and flabby or muscular, and so on. So given any one or two traits, we have some expectation of how those traits will happen together in describing people's personality. Uh, another important influence on uh, impression formation is the way we use categories and typologies. We all have ideas of what typical people are like. These are again simplified guides to behavior and they serve the purpose of cognitive economy. These typologies or categories, person prototypes or stereotypes are very easily formed, often already in childhood, and they tend to be enduring and slow to change. Social norms play an important role in the content of those stereotypes. Uh, for example, the stereotype of women has obviously been changed as a result of feminism. The stereotype of gay people has been changed by the uh, gay rights movement. These stereotypes are not static, but change, but it doesn't mean that they disappear. It's only that their contents become different. Stereotypes can be both positive and negative. And the essence of stereotypes is they reduce individuals to an example of a particular group. Uh, in other words, when you remember when we talked about 
the accuracy of person perception. Stereotype accuracy is one component of the skill. You have to be able to correctly identify the type of person, and you have to counterbalance that by differential accuracy, by also paying attention of how the individual is different. The problem with stereotypes is that people rely on them too much. They tend to not give enough attention to individual differences in characteristics. Uh, stereotypes uh, and typologies are particularly important when they relate to minority groups or groups who, in other words, are disadvantaged. One of the first studies in the United States on stereotypes was carried out by Katz and Braley in 1933, and he found that at that time, black Americans were generally seen as lazy and ignorant, Jews were perceived as shrewd and grasping. Germans were seen as efficient and nationalistic. Remember, this is the 1930s. The English were seen as sportsmanlike and intelligent. And the Japanese were seen as intelligent and industrious. Again, remember, this is the 1930s before the war. Stereotypes tend to become stronger and more negative in times of group conflict. We talked about this in the second lecture, that group ideologies have a very important impact on how people perceive other groups. Hate and hating the outsider is an important political strategy in Germany in the Nazi period, in the USSR, in the Soviet communist period, Russia, China, Hungary, there are many countries in the world where generating dislike or hatred for outgroups is used as a method of improving political legitimacy. Now, where do stereotypes come from? There is a very interesting set of studies by David Hamilton at the University of California on illusory correlation effects. Illusory correlations can account for the emergence of negative stereotypes in many situations, even when they are not justified. Illusory correlation refers to the human tendency to preferentially associate negative qualities with minorities. In other words, when, you, when a person is highly visible because they belong to a minority and they have some negative quality associated with them, there's a strong tendency to assume a strong correlation between group identity and negativity. This slide illustrates the functioning of the illusory correlation effect, the tendency to preferentially associate negative behaviors and traits with members of our minority groups. What happens in this study is that two-thirds of the behaviors were performed by group A members, and two-thirds of the behavior were desirable. So you have a group of, let's say, 30 whites and 20 uh, blacks, and the 30 whites perform two-thirds of positive behaviors and one-third of negative behaviors, exactly the same proportion as the minority group. So essentially, there is nothing to discriminate the two groups. The likelihood of positive as against negative behaviors is exactly the same in the majority group as in the minority group. And yet afterwards, when participants are asked to remember the qualities of the majority and the minority group, you see a very strange bias. For the majority group member, the perceptions are fairly accurate, but for the minority group, there is a huge underestimation of the undesirable behavior, of the desirable behaviors and the overestimation of the undesirable behaviors. In other words, we remember selectively better negative behaviors by minorities compared to the same frequency of negative behaviors by majorities. Now, there is a possible evolutionary explanation for the illusory correlation effect. It suggests that type one error, making a false positive, is less costly than type two error, making a false negative. Uh, in other words, an unusual person is more likely to be noticed, and an unusual person doing something negative 
is significantly more likely to be noticed. We are on the lookout for associations of negative behaviors for, for minorities. This is a very strange effect, and it goes some way towards explaining why often uh, negative attitudes are associated with minority stereotypes, even when there is no objective foundation for this judgmental bias. Now, of course, there are many interesting studies on stereotyping in the literature. Sometimes a name alone is sufficient to elicit stereotypical expectations. Resgan in 1950 published a study when participants were asked to rate pictures of girls who had either traditional or foreign names, for example, Irish, Italian, or Jewish. And the name alone resulted in stereotypic expectations. So girls with Jewish sounding names were judged as more intelligent, but less nice. Of course, the content of stereotypes can change over time. Trish Devine and Elliot in 1995 published a study showing that there is an emerging new black stereotype, which is quite different from the one identified by Katz and Braley in 1933. Uh, that new black stereotype has characteristics like athletic, rhythmic, but still low in intelligence, poor, and more likely to be criminal and loud. Now, categorizing people into types is something that is often problematic and it often produces injustice in perceiving individuals. It's not always cultural stereotypes that we use. Very often we have local stereotypes or prototypes in a given environment. We have done a study at the University of New South Wales when we asked students in the same class you are enrolled in, Psych 2061, to describe typical student types they are familiar with on campus. And we had a whole bunch of descriptions which are illustrated in this cartoon. In those days, surfies were still an identifiable group among students. Radical feminists used to be around engineers, studio students. We had a whole bunch of verbal descriptions of typical UNSW student types. Here is a verbal description of some of the types we have had. Radicals, scruffy appearance, often protesting. They wear overalls of Indian clothes. They hand out leaflets on library loan. They wear badges, organized marches. They are outspoken, noisy, leftist and often live in communal accommodation, and they are aggressive. Or uh, radical feminists, they have left-wing views, outspoken, often lesbian, usually unattractive looking. They have no bra, they wear women's lip bridges, they sell feminist literature, they are aggressive, they have a chip on their shoulder and wear overalls. Uh, these descriptions uh, were actually objectively based on the most common uh, descriptions we got from students. So it wasn't made up by us or by anybody else. We simply counted the terms that were most often used. Uh, a few other types, Christians, fairly innocuous, keen, thrifty, studious, caring, narrow-minded, have Jesus Love You stickers all over their briefcase. They have fish signs over their books. They try to convince others about religions and they go to Bible readings. Now, this seems a little bit dated. This is actually several decades ago that these student prototypes were identified. The question is, what is the consequence of having such prototypes in people's minds that they agree about? It turns out that such schemas influence social cognition including the encoding, a storage, and the retrieval of information by providing frameworks for organizing and interpreting new information. It turns out that people selectively remember information about the target person that happens to be consistent with the schema. Having those prototypes also saves us considerable mental effort, again, cognitive efficiency. And schemas act as a cognitive filter during attention and encoding. If you identify a target person as belonging to a particular prototype, let's say radical feminists, 
you will selectively be looking out for characteristics which are consistent with that type and will tend to pass over or ignore characteristics which are different. It's also interesting that our memories tend to persist about typologies even when you have disconfirming information. So even if you find out that a particular person does not have the prototypical characteristics of a type, the tendency to continually assume that those characteristics exist is still there. That's a perseverance effect. Prototypes determine what stays with us. And finally, prototypes tend to promote a self-confirming effect, a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you expect a person to have typical characteristics, you will be looking for them and you often find them. Just as the study at the University of New South Wales shows, in every culture and subculture, naturally, there arise stereotypes of typical people that are familiar to members of that culture. This figure illustrates some common typical stereotypes in Australia, as found in a study by Durante and others in 2013. They argue that most stereotypes can be distinguished along two fundamental dimensions, competence and warmth. So if you look at the different categories in this figure, you can classify them in terms of how they are perceived as either warm, cold, or competent, incompetent. Now, stereotypes and expectations can be very important in everyday life in distorting our perception and judgments. This picture shows an image of a subway car in New York. It was used in 1947 by Gordon Allport and Leo Postman. He asked, they asked participants to look at that picture for a short period of time, and afterwards they were asked to describe what's happening. Now, a lot of people reported that there is some kind of an altercation going on between the black person and the white person, and a number of people reported that the black person was holding a razor. Uh, when you look more carefully at this complex and somewhat fuzzy picture, you see that the opposite is the case. The black person is pointing a finger, the white person is holding a razor. So what's happening here is that observers looking at a complex image will encode the information that there is an altercation, a fight, and they also notice that there is a razor, but they incorrectly attribute the razor to be in the hands of the black person rather than the white person. This is a very nice illustration of how stereotypic expectations can distort the way we perceive complex social scenes. Here is another experiment by Duncan in 1977, 76 actually, illustrating a somewhat similar tendency. Students in this study were shown a videotape in which either a black student shoved a white student or the other way around, a white student shoved a black student slightly. So in other words, there was an ambiguous situation and the question was, how do you interpret what's happening here? The results showed that the interpretations were very different depending on our, depending on the racial stereotype. When a black person is shoving a white person, it was significantly more likely to be interpreted as violent and aggressive, as you see on the left-hand side figure. Exactly the same behavior performed by the white person was interpreted as horseplaying and dramatization, in other words, innocuous. Exactly the same physical behavior can appear to be aggressive depending on your stereotype or it can appear to be harmless if it's performed by a white person. It's a, again a very nice illustration of how even the interpretation of a directly observed behavior on a video can take on very different meanings depending on what kind of stereotype is associated with that. Stereotypes have another effect. 
we have more information, more detailed knowledge about our own group than we have about an out group or a minority group. And this information complexity or information richness also has an effect. Linville and Jones in 1980 published a paper in which they asked subjects to rate white and black applicants to law school who had either strong or weak credentials. So the person is described as either white or black and they have either uh, strong or weak credentials. The question is, how do people assess these credentials? And you see an interesting interaction. When the black person had strong credentials, he was evaluated more positively than the white person. When the black person had weak credentials, he was evaluated more negatively. In other words, being black magnified the effects of the credentials. Uh, the judges relied more on the evidence of the credentials. In the case of the out group, presumably because they had less detailed knowledge and information about the art group. So in that sense, being a member of a minority group can also be beneficial because people in the absence of other information might pay more attention to objective qualifications, even more so than for a white applicant. As always, how we process information has a big influence on how much these heuristics, shortcuts, prototypes, stereotypes, biases come to influence our judgments. As this figure shows, there are basically two ways in which human beings faced with the barrage of complex information about the social world deal with that rich source of information. At the bottom of the figure, if you give careful consideration to all the information, that, of course, takes time, effort, and is more difficult to do. But if you do that, then you are more likely to produce fair treatment of other people. The alternative in the face of this information overload is to rely on shortcuts, cognitive habits like stereotypes, schemas, expectations, heuristics. When this kind of processing is adopted, which is basically the type one processing that Kahneman described, we tend to attend to and remember selectively facts which happen to be consistent with the stereotype and ignore or forget facts which are inconsistent with the stereotype. And the outcome of that is often prejudice and discrimination. When we attribute stereotypic traits to an individual, essentially, we are performing an injustice because we are not looking at the individual, individual as a unique person, but we rely on our pre-existing expectations to form a judgment. Now, a rather controversial question is, is there a grain of truth in stereotypes? It's very commonly assumed that stereotypes are a bad thing and they distort reality and they lead to injustice. And that by and large is the case. Stereotypes are a violation of our duty to pay correct attention to every individual. So applying stereotypes to individuals is always unjust. But we could still ask the question, are there any group differences that actually are reflected in stereotypes in a way that they have some foundation of reality. Apparently, there is a strong literature in the social psychology uh, literature which shows that stereotypes often can have a grain of truth in them. They can be accurate. They can correctly reflect group characteristics. I have to emphasize not necessarily individual characteristics. Individuals are always unique. But on the average, stereotypes might have content which actually does correspond to uh, actual behavioral differences. There are a large number of studies on this. I'm just mentioning one here. This is a study by Ostermann and others, 1994. What the study showed 
is that if you actually observe the behavior of black and white children in the playground, in the United States, black children actually display more aggressive behavior. And this is manifest both in self ratings as well as in ratings by others compared to Caucasian children in the United States and also compared to children in Poland and Finland. Now, these behavioral differences, of course, can be due to a large number of different factors, most likely cultural, socialization, and normative factors. But nevertheless, to the extent that behavioral differences can be identified, they do suggest that at the group level, there may be some grain of truth in the content of the stereotype. Stereotypic information is extremely common and according to a recent test, it is subconsciously encoded in the way we represent reality. We're going to demonstrate that using the Implicit Associations Test or the IAT, uh, which is a measure of subconscious or implicit stereotypic associations. This demonstration will involve the following. Stop the video at the next slide and then read each word one at a time on the list containing English or Arabic names and positive or negative words. Your task is the following. Classify each word as either English or Arabic or positive or negative, as if you were responding on a computer keyboard. But this time you can simply hit your right knee with your right hand when the word is positive or an English name and hit your left knee with your left hand when the word is negative or an Arabic name. When you're ready, move on to the next slide and stop it. Here is the list of words you need to classify. Take as long as necessary. Feel free to stop the video until you finish the task. That wasn't so difficult, was it? Now we are going to do a second task. It's again classifying words but this time hit your right knee when the word is positive and the left knee when the word is negative and hit your right knee when the name is Arabic and left knee when the name is Anglo-Saxon. So once again left is negative and English, right positive and Arab. Ready? Go to the next slide, stop it and do the test. Again here is the target list read through the words and classify each of them as you read. Take as long as necessary. Feel free to stop the video if you need to until you finish. Which of the two tasks was easier to perform and took less time to complete? A lot of studies show that in conditions when, for example, the Arab negative and the English positive words are on the same side, task one in the present situation, this is easier to perform and faster than when the Arab positive and the English negative categories are paired, task two in the present situation. In other words, positive traits seem to be more easily and readily associated with English names rather than Arabic names. Greenwald and Banaji, who designed this test, argue that in a very large number of studies, there is evidence for more positive implicit associations for majority rather than minority groups, which seems to suggest that stereotype knowledge, the positive and negative evaluation of different groups, is very deeply and subconsciously encoded. This is evidenced also that almost everybody shows this effect. It's practically a universal effect whether you are yourself explicitly prejudiced or not prejudiced. There's also evidence that implicit associations are very difficult or impossible to change. They lie deeply below your level of consciousness. As a result, implicit association scores are not reliably linked to explicit prejudice. There are very few and debated studies which show that people who score high on implicit associations actually also uh, engage in more prejudiced or discriminatory behaviors. It does not seem to be a reliable link. And therefore, this test is not really appropriate to demonstrate prejudice and discrimination. 
much more likely it tells us something about the nature of cognitive associations about groups which are very deeply embedded in the way we link positive and negative characteristics to majority and minority groups. As we have seen, the human tendency to categorize information and to use stereotypes is very deeply ingrained and may even be subconscious. So the question arises, is it really possible to control or eliminate stereotypes? Categorizing social information in the evolutionary past has often been adaptive and it is also cognitively efficient and many stereotypes do contain accurate information. So what we have seen is that group stereotypes have been adaptive in the past, but they are now proving problematic because we live in a very different social environment characterized by diversity and very heterogeneous populations. The injustice, the problem arises when we apply group stereotypes to unique individuals. When we treat people as if they were a representation of the group to which they belong, rather than giving them the uh, respect and treat them as unique individuals. In order to manage the human tendency to categorize and stereotype, there are at least two alternative philosophical approaches or strategies. The first one is what we might call the individualistic enlightenment approach, which we mentioned in the second lecture. This implies that we focus on the individual instead of the group category. This is the approach that has been advocated by Martin Luther King and the Dalai Lama as we looked at this issue in the second lecture. And this approach has generally been highly successful in reducing discrimination and injustice. By emphasizing universal individual features and equality, we really focus on the fact that we all belong to one group, the human group Homo sapiens. In everyday life, it's a very useful approach that in forming impressions of people, we should always focus on the best diagnostic information available, which is always the individual person rather than our stereotypes. In terms of managing our stereotyping, instead of trying to manipulate thinking, probably focusing on controlling and regulating problematic behavior is the best approach to pursue and many institutions, including our university, have rules about uh, how we should behave in a diverse, tolerant and socially equal environment. The alternative philosophical approach to managing uh, group harmony and to control stereotyping is a collectivist group identity approach or identity politics, which explicitly emphasizes the importance of group identity as an all important feature. Of course, that runs the risk that instead of reducing stereotyping, we make stereotypes the defining feature of how people should be dealt with. Uh, according to this model, we should regulate rights and obligations in terms of an individual's identity group membership rather than the unique individual characteristics. A typical uh, manifestation of this strategy is affirmative action and the use of group quotas in order to provide benefits to groups that have been discriminated against in the past, which is different from using individual merit in evaluating people. Have a look at that uh, video on affirmative action and the use of group quotas. Of course, the uh, use of group categories and group identity is potentially problematic because it might also promote a culture of victimhood and helplessness by labeling people belonging to particular groups automatically as victims and disadvantaged, even if this may not actually apply to their individual circumstances. And applying this kind of ideology in institutional settings, for example, in the legal system, can sometimes result in injustices, 
against individuals who might be treated less fairly than they deserve to be treated otherwise. So just to overview, uh, this lecture, these two lectures were really about social perception and cognition. That ability of human beings to perceive, interpret, and make sense of other people is really the foundation of human sociability and all civilization and cultural progress. We have seen, however, that social percep perception and cognition are highly constructive and that we often use shortcuts and biases in interpreting the social world. Some of these mental habits have an evolutionary origin. For example, the tendency to simplify and categorize is one example of such a universal cognitive habit. We have seen that these uh, social judgmental strategies have important social consequences for life in a diverse heterogeneous society, such as the mass societies we live in today. In the next couple of lectures, we are going to move on and we are going to discuss the way human beings form inferences and how they attribute causality.